Thanks so much, everyone. Wow, this is cool. A lot of energy, a lot of stomping. I love that. Um, and um, Sasha, that was a really nice intro, but uh, most people are just interested in my dog. <laughs> yeah, of course. I was uh, coming in and passing some folks in the lobby, and they're like, look at that amazing dog. <laughs> Man's best friend, what a noble creature. Wow, look at him work. Oh, I love your dog. And then I'm walking away and I heard, I think that guy climbed Everest blind. So <laughs> I'm used to taking a back seat. I did it back in BC. I did it. I've been doing it always. This guy's awesome. He's my fourth dog. And uh, he's going to fall asleep now. When I first was doing a talk, actually, I was sitting in the second front row uh, going up on stage. These two guys were sitting in front of me. They didn't know I was the speaker. And one guy turns to his friend. He goes, I hope this guy isn't boring. And his friend whispers back, well, if he is, you know he's blind. We can just walk out. He won't know the difference. <laughs> so, so since then, I trained the dog t to attack anyone <laughs> who makes any sudden movements towards the door. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to use the bathroom. <laughs> you can outrun him. <laughs> no, he's, he's not a, he's a lover. He'll, he'll be asleep in a second, as I said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm a graduate of BC. This time, my alma mater. It's so exciting to be back here. Gosh, I love it. I mean, first of all, I should say that, like, you know, I didn't even hardly recognize some of the campus because there's been so much change in the last 25 years. Um, I used to run tours. Um, to, to all the prospective students. And, uh, and, but, but now I'm like, just like, there's so much new stuff. And the infrastructure has strengthened BC for sure. But what I'm most impressed by is that I, when I was here, I thought it was a very strong community. That's one of the things that drew me to this college. But now, 25 years later, the community is even stronger. And uh, right here, just all of you together, connecting in this way is a wonderful testament to the strength of your community. So thanks for letting me be a part of it. Um, I've kept a couple things from my BC experience. This scar here, uh, I, was, I, was, I was coming home from a party and I was running full blast across the Dust Bowl and my dog didn't look up and there was a sign and I blasted into that thing. Uh, I flew back on my back. I was blood pouring down my face. I, you know, I know we're here to talk about faith. I, I certainly didn't find it at 2 in the morning running across the Dust Bowl. Uh, um, but it, is, it, was, it was a great testament to the medical facilities here. I was, they patched me right up and got me right back to class. So, um, but thank you for having me back. And um, so, so speaking of blind climbing, um, I might as, well, might as well start there because um, uh, in 2001, some of you know that I had the privilege of climbing Mount Everest, and that was so exciting, you know, but it's hard, too, because you're climbing up what's through the uh, Kumbu Icefall. The Kumbu Icefall, it's about 3,000 feet of jumbled up boulders of ice of every size imaginable, from skyscrapers down to baseballs, collapsing, exploding down the mountain like a river of ice. It doesn't meet Americans with Disability Act standards. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and, and then climbing through that, and then the ladders, four or five ladders lashed together with Sherpa, you know, Kmart boat twine. Uh, you got to get across these things quickly and safely. Yeah, getting to that first ladder, I wanted to crawl, you know, but the Sherpas will count you out if you crawl. So you got to walk boldly across these ladders. Um, in fact, uh, uh, they're really deep, too. Um, uh, you know, the Sherpas say that, that if, you, if you fall into one of these crevasses, you wind up in Boston College. So they're really deep. And uh, Chris Morris, one of my team members, said, you know, you think you have it so hard, but thus sighted people. We get to look down through the rungs. So maybe you have it easy. And then climbing up uh, through that ice fall 10 times and um, up uh, the Lhotse face and up to Geneva Spur, across the knife edge. Well, there's a 12,000 foot drop on that side, there's a 9,000 foot drop on that side. It doesn't really matter which side you fall off of. Just <laughs> climbing, keeping your mind still, climbing the Hillary step near the top, taking six breaths between each step, 
six breaths, reach the summit. You're standing on an island like the size of a single car garage in the sky. You can't believe you're there. You literally, your brain has not caught up to your body. And then you come down. The real work happens as you come down. I'm coming down the mountain. I was really exhausted. Your legs are like stretched so many, t like a rubber band that's been stretched too many times. There's windburn on top of sunburn on your face. You're, you, you're breathing so hard that your tongue is hanging out of your mouth. And the sun reflects off the snow and bounces up in your tongue. And it burns your tongue. And so you have sunburn on your tongue. It's swollen up and you can't talk. And I got down through the ice fall that last time and I knew I was safe. I knew I was going to live. I was so happy celebrating. PV, our team leader, this amazing leader, he brought us all together and he said, congratulations, your lives are about to change in lots of ways. And then he pulled me aside and I, you know, I thought he was going to like have me sign his t-shirt or something. And he said, Eric, he said, do me a favor. Don't let this mountain, don't let Everest be the greatest thing you ever do. And I thought, PV, that's really bad timing. Uh, <laughs> you know, most people are just dreaming about food and about uh, the comforts of home. I was dreaming of a nice, smooth sidewalk. Just like, give me a sidewalk that I can walk down and it won't kill me. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I thought about what PV was saying. Like, what is he saying? Like, just keep doing harder and harder things, riskier and riskier things. Keep trying to top yourself, you know? Take a cooler Facebook picture. I, I, I didn't know what he meant. And so I just went on this sort of storm of energy moving me forward, uh, lots of celebration. You know, where do you go after you climb Everest? <laughs> <laughs> Got to climb the Matterhorn with Mickey and Goofy and... Uh, and, and uh, tried some new sports. You gotta, you gotta keep your mind open to some new sports. And we, uh, are you looking at what I'm not looking at back there? <laughs> are we having some technical difficulties? Oh yeah, so the new sport, next picture. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, anyway, that one didn't show up, but it was, it's me riding an ostrich. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Uh, but those, some of those sports didn't work out. But, um, but I, was, I, I had started a fledgling organization at that time called No Barriers, and, and we were just testing out some ideas, and we were, we were going, uh, I'd taken a, a team of disabled kids down the Grand Canyon. We were rafting in big 30-foot rafts, and I, I was so intrigued. So I had climbed lots of mountains. I had climbed the seven summits, the tallest mountain in every continent, but I was really intrigued by rivers. Um, by the, this incredible canyon of the Grand Canyon, incredible natural beauty, whether you can see it or not. You know, you can hear the echo of the walls above you, um, the vibration of sound off those walls, and the river being the gauntlet to some of the most incredible whitewater in the world. And then that, the energy of rivers, though, was really fascinating to me. And I wanted to understand if I could ever flourish in that kind of environment that was so incredibly different from a mountain. And I thought if I was going to experience that, I would wanted to do it close up. You know, not in a big giant raft, but down right against the water at the surface uh, in a kayak. And so um, that began um, a six-year journey to begin to learn to whitewater kayak. And, and so uh, at 40 years old, I found myself on the banks of the Colorado River thinking, you know, I climbed Everest. Why am I so scared? I am so scared. I'm just listening to the roar of the river below me. And, you know, um, I, I just feel overwhelmed. Um, and how does a blind person kayak? Well, there was lots of things to figure out along the way. Uh, how my team would communicate with me. Um, how um, they would communicate, in, and I would be even able to hear them through the, through the roar of the river, sometimes separated by waves that were 10, 20 feet tall, and uh, we'd 
sort of stumbled upon this amazing technology, this Bluetooth technology that communicates in real time so that my friends can be behind me yelling very precise directions. You know, you know that if you're a foot to the left or a foot too far to the right, it's the difference between getting through that rapid and getting hammered. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, how does a blind person learn to kayak? Check this out. This will answer some of it. You can hear this really deep roar. Not being able to see it, it's almost, well, maybe it's more intimidating than being able to see it. It's shifting. It's changing directions. It's tossing you side to side unexpectedly. And you're trying to bust through that totally chaotic environment just by the sound of your guide's voice, by the sound of the river, and by what you're feeling under your boat. I've worked hard. I've put in hundreds of hours of repetition only to get smacked down, flipped over, pull my skirt, and there I am, swimming again. One of the biggest challenges has been how to deal with fear, not to let it paralyze me and crush my confidence. Because every run, even if it's down the same rapid, it's totally different. And when one thing goes wrong, and it often does, it's a cascading series of things going even worse. And trying to respond to all that, it's like sensory overload. There were days uh, that I'd get off the river, you know, after that, you know, that thousands of hours of training of, of sort of flailing and bleeding, slamming into rocks, pulling the skirt of my kayak and swimming uh, through these rapids. I'd get out of the river and I'd be sitting on the banks and I'd say, okay, I got to keep it positive. What did I learn today? I learned why there aren't that many blind kayakers in the world. Um, <clears throat> But I had that purpose of hopefully having this audacious goal to, to, to kayak the Grand Canyon. And, but so, you know, as the inspirational blind guy, I guess, I, I, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but I sort of hate when people tell me anything is possible. <laughs> because I think, like, have you kayaked blind lately? Uh, <laughs> like, there's a lot of challenges. You know, forget mountains and rivers. Think about all the barriers in your lives. You know, just waking up and getting to class and on the sports field, in the classroom, uh, all the challenge of trying to balance your life, of trying to find purpose, trying to push against these big forces that want to knock you flat on your back as you try to live a life that matters. Um, I, I wrote uh, my second book <clears throat> was this book I teamed up with. It was called The Adversity Advantage. I teamed up with the scientist, Dr. Paul Stoltz, and we studied people and teams around the world, <clears throat> and we came away understanding that people, simply put, they fall into three categories. They're either quitters, campers, or climbers. Now, quitters, we won't talk about them tonight, but campers are a fascinating group because, well, they make up so much of the world. There are those of us who start out climbing. We start out with hope and optimism and excitement, and then somewhere along the way we stop. Maybe we get really scared, and something happens to us that scares us, and we say, I never want to feel that kind of terror, that kind of sense of powerlessness again. Or maybe uh, we make uh, a mistake, and it, it affects so many people. We say, I don't want to feel that again. Or maybe we just you know, as we get older, we start feeling uh, like a little more cynical, like in the, that cynicism pours down around our brain like prison bars. Or we wake up and the world's changed and we just don't know how to attack it. Or, you know, plodding away and these barriers keep getting in our way like brick walls and they wear us down and they shove us to the sidelines. And now we're in a place we didn't want to be. 
You know, we're not the best version of ourselves. Uh, and we're starting, we're starting to camp. And climbers are a rare group. They're, they're those of us, they're those people who figure out a way to continue to grow and evolve and explore and challenge themselves every day of their lives until the day they die. And I think there are a lot of climbers out here. So the question, I think, is how do we climb? How do we continue to climb when it is so much easier? It, it, it makes so much more sense to camp. Well, I, I personally know what it's like to be a camper because when I was in middle school, I got derailed. It was about a week before my freshman high, in high school. I went blind from this incredibly rare eye disease. Uh, and I remember being led into school for the first time as a newly blinded person, being led to the bathroom, being led to class, being led into the cafeteria, sitting at a table by myself and looking at my life through a rear view mirror into the past, you know, all the things I'd lost, the things, uh, the people I'd never see, the faces, you know, those beautiful vi visual things that I'd never see again. But more importantly than that, I listened to all the food fights and all the excitement and laughter and joy around me. The biggest fear wasn't going blind. The biggest fear was that I would be swept to the sidelines and I would be forgotten. I'd be left in that dark place and forgotten. It was terrifying. A life lived for nothing. And I could still see just a little bit out of my right eye. And one of the things I could still do was to watch TV. But I had to get really close to the screen, uh, press my nose right up against the TV. And one night, I was watching this show. They were focusing on this guy his name was Terry Fox. Now, Carrie, uh, Terry was a Canadian, and, and he had lost a leg to cancer. And he was still in the hospital when he decided that he was going to run across Canada. Now, I can tell you, that is not the normal, intuitive decision a person in his situation was supposed to make. You know, this is a marathon a day. This is thousands of miles. Uh, most people, you learn to curl up and, and shrink and protect the little bit you have left. But nobody had taught Terry that because somehow he knew that between the things that happen to you and the ways that you are supposed to react, there's a space. And in that space, there's a choice. It's never an easy choice, but it's still a choice. And, and, and he chose to attack. And, and, and see, so he was in the hospital, and he was watching kids die of cancer, much younger than him. And instead of allowing that tragedy to crush him, he gathered it up, and he converted it into something else, something bigger, a kind of darkness into vision. And he used it as energy to propel him forward, every faltering step along that road. And th that road, by the way, took a terrible toll on his body. You know, the shell that we we're in, you know, it, the it blisters all over his stumps, the look on his face, an absolute contradiction, full of exhaustion, yet at the same time, full of exaltation. And I thought to myself, there's something inside all of us, and Terry especially, the only way I could describe it at the time was a light. A light that seemed to be able to feed on that frustration. To, to, you know, to use those things as fuel. The greater the challenge, the brighter that light kept burning. And, and I realized that I had been focusing on all the things I had lost out there. I was reeling and reacting and blaming and attacking. But I needed to turn inward to that light. I hoped it existed in me, if I could use it to turn into that storm of life and emerge on the other side, not just unscathed, not just damaged as little as possible, but actually stronger and better. And so uh, it was a few months after that, 
I got this letter in Braille. It was a group. They were taking blind kids rock climbing uh, just north of here, North Conway, New Hampshire. And I ran my hand up the wall of my room, and I thought, who would be stupid enough to take a blind kid rock climbing? <laughs> so I signed up. <laughs> I, I was tired of building walls around myself and protecting myself. I wanted to tear down those walls. Uh, I wanted to sort of let that light expose it to the world. And, and I learned that uh, through trial and error, I could rock climb. I could do a pull up up the rock, rock face, and I could scan my other hand across the face. And just before I would lose strength in my forearms and fingers, and I had to fall, I'd find enough to dig into a little crack or a pocket to keep me stuck so I could, so I could do another pull up. I left a lot of blood and skin on the rock. Uh, but I got to the top, and it was so exhilarating. It was so, it was so vibrant. It was almost painful. It was like a rebirth. I got to say, though, as beautiful as it was, as vibrant as it was, it was, it was also scary. <laughs> and there's really one thing that hasn't changed much since that very first time I went rock climbing about 30 years ago, and that's the reach. You know, I think in a way, whether you're blind or not, we're all reaching, right? We're all reaching towards something. We're all reaching uh, uh, toward, towards amazing things, amazing pursuits. We're all reaching for something bigger than ourselves, some kind of purpose in our lives. We're reaching for these things. And, and I think what holds us back is the fear, the fear of flopping on our face of falling, of making a mistake that affects so many people, the fear that we're not as good as we wanted to be, the fear that we've climbed as high as we can go, there's nowhere else to go but down. These fears, they conspire against us and they paralyze us. And may we decide to stop reaching. When I think there is a big difference between many people and those who embrace that reach, they understand it's, it's an ongoing, never-ending process reaching out into the darkness towards <laughs> immense possibilities. Immense possibilities. They're always unseen, yet they are sensed. While so many others allow that darkness to paralyze them. I reached out that day. I know you reach out every day. Uh, and it has led and will continue to lead towards great adventures. Uh, this is the 3,000 foot El, uh, face of El Capitan and beautiful ice climbs around the world. I will say, though, that there is a challenge here, because when we think about embracing this no barriers life, this kind of life that is about breaking through barriers, we will uh, we, we will encounter some challenges along the way. And it's not like we're asking for those challenges but they'll find us. You know, I'll tell you, if you, if you want to sit on the couch and, uh, and hang out, you're going to live an easier life than, than if you're trying to climb higher and higher and trying to pursue deep questions out there and within you. You're going to, it'll be a much easier life. I think there is a, a connection between the extent of our reach and the amount of adversity we accept into our lives. The two go hand in hand. There's just no way to separate it. And I think also in reverse, when you look at the barriers in your life, when you look at these big challenges, these ceilings all around us, we first, you know, we feel kind of helpless. We feel overwhelmed. But then we commit, like Terry, we commit to attacking those things. And it releases tremendous energy and potential within us that feeds our, our, ourselves. Uh, I don't think it's enough to solve problems or keep up with the pace of change. I think we got we to gotta be really relentless and look at those ceilings, identify them, and turn into the storm. Uh, it takes a lot of courage, though, to turn into the storm, not to bury our heads in the sand. Uh, towards, these, towards these challenges that are either in front of us, they're big and small, sometimes they're on the horizon ready to bear down on us. The, the best example I've ever seen of a person able to do this is a friend of mine. Uh, his, his name is Mark Wellman. When Mark was in his 20s, he was a brilliant climber. He was headed towards great things. And then he fell. He fell. 
He fell about 150 feet. He broke his back. Game over. But he decided that he was going to learn to climb again. And he went out and he developed this system, this technology. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. His partner anchors the rope and then Mark has this pull-up bar and it locks onto the rope. He pulls himself up. He slides up the rope. He pushes the bar up. He pulls himself up. He slides up the rope. Uh, he only gets about six inches up with each pull-up. He climbed El Capitan, 3,000 foot feet of overhanging granite. They estimated he did over 7,000 pull-ups in eight days. I call people like Mark alchemists. Alchemists. They can take the lead that life piles on top of them, and they will figure out a way to transform it into gold. And they don't just do the things that you hear so much about. They don't like avoid adversity or challenge. They don't, uh, they don't just deal with it. What they figured out, I think, is pretty different. They figured out how to seize hold of that storm of challenge that swirls around us to harness its energy and use that energy to propel themselves forward to places that they may not have gone to in any other way. With an alchemist, you know, you can throw them in this fierce, uncertain environment, uh, strip away their resources, throw roadblocks in front of them, and they'll still find a way to win. Not despite adversity because of it. I think, I think if we want to win and grow and innovate and create these strong teams around us, the way we harness those challenges, those challenges may be our greatest advantage. Well, Mark invited me climbing, and that was a really amazing invitation. I said 100% yes. We, he invited me to climb this big 1,000-foot tower in, near Moab, Utah. Uh, he said, I have a third climber with us uh, who's coming out. His name's Hugh Herr. Um, and Hugh has an amazing story of his own. Hugh's not out there, is he? No. Yeah. Um, when Hugh was 17, he was a really amazing climber. And he was climbing Mount Washington in the winter. He got lost. And uh, his legs froze. Uh, they had to be amputated. When Hugh woke up in the hospital, uh, he said to me that he looked down at where his legs used to be, where they were supposed to be, where the sheets just dropped off into space. And he wailed. He had screwed up his life, screwed up the life of people around him. But he told me the greatest breakthrough of his life, one of the greatest breakthroughs, was when he looked down at where his legs were supposed to be. And instead of seeing loss, what he saw was a blank canvas, a blank canvas. And, and he was the painter. He could build in that space whatever his mind could conceive and he wanted to climb. So he built these legs. They looked pretty wild. They're little legs with tiny little feet that he could use to wedge into cracks. No human foot could even stand up in those little seams. And he became a way better climber as an amputee in certain ways than he was when he had legs. <laughs> in fact, they, he was ranked in the top 10 climbers in the country. Uh, they called him the first $6 million man. Uh, there is a climb near where I live in Colorado. Nobody could get to the top of this thing. And Hugh f flashed it. He climbed it. And somebody said, Hugh, tell us your secret. He said, well, it wasn't that big a deal. I just, you know, there was a hold out of people's reach. So I just made my legs a foot longer. <laughs> That's what an alchemist does. And Hugh went back to school. After that, he said his life, he couldn't waste his life. It was really important that he do something with his life. He went back to school and he got a PhD in bioengineering and now he runs the biomechatronics laboratory at MIT, fusing human beings with machines, building the most sophisticated prosthetic legs in the world. Uh, but back then, we were just dirt bags. And, um, <laughs> And, and we climbed this tower together. We were like, sort of like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Check out the three of us climbing here. You ready? Yeah. I weigh about 160. <laughs> OK. OK. Yeah, dude. Pretty chilly up here. 
hands cold? A little bit, they're not going numb though. Are you? So good to be out of my wheelchair. Thank you. So, that's, yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> that experience climbing with Hugh and Mark was for me the conception of what we call now no barriers. I listened to Hugh and Mark climbing, especially Mark, and the way he kind of pulled himself up the rope in this herky jerky way, sort of like the way Terry Fox had run. I thought this process of growth, of change, of transformation, it is not neat and tidy. It, it's not like in the movies, like a nice sweeping arc upward with a nice crescendo at the top. Growth and change and transformation are like a volcano spewing lava. And I wanted to understand that process. I wanted to illuminate that murky process with all its grittiness, all its naked truth. And the second thing I was, that, that didn't go past me was the fact that just like I had seen that light in Terry Fox years and years before, I felt that same light in Mark and Hugh, and I wondered how you could export it, how you could help others tap into it, to grow it and nurture it. And that light could easily be called the human spirit or the soul, something deep within us that we commit to growing and nurturing and using it to blaze into the world, to light our way forward towards our own purpose and our own fulfillment. And since then, No Barriers uh, has grown. We've grown a lot into this movement uh, and uh, we teamed up with Hugh and Mark to build this organization. We, it's predicated on this idea that what's within us is stronger than what's in our way. We bring together amazing people. They're engineers and scientists and technologists and, and spiritual leaders and philosophers and artists and musicians and athletes and humanitarians all together to help people lead the way forward to teach them new ideas and new mindsets and how to tap into that light. One of the people we brought in was my friend Amanda Boxtel. She had been in a wheelchair for 30 years. And she, at our last summit, she stood up on the stage using this amazing new exoskeleton technology. She walked across the stage, she walked down the stairs, she pointed at a group of wheelchair users in the front row, and, and she said, get ready to walk. That's no barriers. Well, I started this on the Grand Canyon, and I want to resume it, because uh, in 2015, we were ready to go. I had gone through this process. I was ready. I'd built this amazing team around me. I had my friend Harlan Tanney. He had 
kayaked the Grand Canyon a hundred times. He was half human, half dolphin. Amazing kayaker. Um, but despite that amazing team I had around me, I was still consumed by fear. Consumed by fear. You know, I'd eat breakfast before a rapid, and, uh, and I'd call it dry heaves and toast. It, you know, I just was consumed by it. And, and, I, and sometimes when I thought about this journey ahead, all the things that I would encounter on the Grand Canyon, it filled me with dread and apprehension. And I wondered why I didn't sort of look at the river in a more optimistic way. Uh, you know, and it came down, I think, after all the preparation, it came down to faith. It came down to this decision that we make in our lives. Is it a good journey? Is the river leading you down towards doom and destruction and loss? Or is it a good journey? Fundamentally, is it a good journey that's leading you to somewhere towards self-discovery? And, 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 and so we were approaching a rapid um, called Upset. It's one of the biggies. One of the really big ones. And it had a giant hole in the middle. A, sh a hole is like a washing machine, and it was very much to be avoided. And I remember sitting there with Harlan, scouting that uh, rapid, and just uh, feeling such fear. Um, and uh, I want to bring in my, a passage from my book that really talks about that experience. Uh, I don't read that well. So I would like to bring up Megan, Megan Hopkins, who is a theology uh, major, grad student here at BC, and she's nice enough to come on up and uh, read this passage from No Barriers. Could you come up, Megan? There you are. And I'll stand aside. That fear and anxiety only gets in the way, Harlan said, clouding your movements and reactions. Then, the next thing you know, you're surrounded by massive chaos, and it overwhelms you. Instead, I think of it as surrendering everything to the river and channeling your energy into perfect focus, just reacting and becoming a part of what the water is doing. As I retreated to my tent, I was conflicted. I kept mulling over what Harlan had said, and I couldn't figure out whether the river was an ominous demon or whether it was an entity I could trust, one that was inviting me forward. When did you fight the river with everything you had and when could you trust it and ride the flow? It seemed like a paradox. When we reached Upset the next day, Harlan had everyone land and hop out to scout. Upset was already significant, but at this water level, he said it got even trickier and more dangerous. He pulled me aside and spoke in a clear, measured voice. Okay, it's pretty spicy, but there's a perfect line to snake it cleanly, although it'll feel pretty counterintuitive. The setup is everything. You enter left, and you keep pushing left into these lateral waves. They're actually crashing off of the left cliff, cliff wall. Your brain is telling you don't go over there, but you have to go left. That big hole Lonnie and Timmy were talking about is to your right, and it is violent. It's a place you don't want to be. You want to hit the lateral perfectly on the left, catch the current, and sneak by the big hole on your right. Bam, done, you got this, E. I nodded, but in reality, I just kept thinking about that violent hole that had subbed Timmy and where Lonnie had swam, the place where you didn't want to be. We got back in our boats. The safety guides paddled into position, and mercifully, as Harlan said, check, check, the radios were working. E, don't let your mind get in the way here. I heard Harlan's soothing voice. Your mind can be the barrier between you and the river between thinking it and just feeling it and being there with it. If your mind gets in the way, then you're defeating the purpose of what this experience is about. I let his words wash over me, nodding, slowing my breathing, pushing the fear to the outside edges of my awareness. I want you to try something, he went on. Forget that I'm here, that I'm giving you commands to follow. Think of my voice as a line of communication to the water as a conduit to the river. Allow yourself to feel the intricacies of the rapid. Envision the tongue like a runway as we drop in. Imagine the waves, the canyon light glimmering off them, foam and spray igniting in flashes of color and light. Feel the power of the big, green, beautiful waves. 
Try to truly be here, not fighting against it, not surviving it, but connected to this place. I'll be right behind you to share everything that we're doing. Okay, I said, listening hard to the deep rumble below and trying to feel the surface of the water through the bottom of my boat. I sat up, exhaled, and I tried to pull some of the river's energy into my lungs. Then we were paddling toward upset. Be clear, calm, in the moment, he said. I focused on each paddle stroke, each riffle of the water, and the space between each breath. Time seemed to slow down just a bit as I dropped in, turning left and left and left, against the massive waves surging off the canyon wall and collapsing over me. I busted through the cold wall of water and heard Harlan yell, hold that line. I felt myself riding on a narrow seam, just between a swirling upheaval to my left, like bombs exploding on a battlefield, and the bottomless hole churning to my right, like a guttural roar coming up from the depths of the river. I rode the chaos, water, spray, and air all merging together, and it didn't feel as threatening because I felt like I was a part of it. There was no kayaker, no boat, no paddle, just pure awareness, reacting without conscious thought. Then everything grew calm around me, and I knew the river had allowed me to pass through. That evening at Tuck Up Camp, the blazing sun finally passed behind the canyon rim, and the air grew soft and still. I sat on the sand, alone, at the river's edge, reflecting on my experience. It felt like six years of kayaking, culminating in one brief but perfect moment, and I wanted to remember to bask in it for a little longer. Harlan had said the river was too big to fight against. My ongoing dreams had been of the river swallowing me, pulling me down into darkness, into nothingness. Climbing mountains hadn't really prepared me either, I thought. Climbing was more about bringing yourself forth, asserting your will over an extreme, inhospitable environment. Yet trying to apply that learning to rivers had failed. Perhaps the secrets of a river were not revealed by trying to exert the ego over it, but rather by letting go and allowing the river to consume you, all the way down to the core, by simply giving in to the unknowable. By surrendering, it allowed the river to erode everything and wash away the crust until there was nothing left but that inner light, the same one I had felt many years ago within Terry Fox. Unencumbered, that light was free to flow out and fuse with the landscape, with the energy of the unstoppable river. Maybe this was as close as we could ever get to understanding, just a brief mortal flash of that light connecting with something bigger, something mysterious and infinite. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I sat on the banks, tears pouring down my face, just overwhelmed by beauty and joy and connection uh, with my team, with this place, um, with that light. And, and then a few days later, um, we came into the biggest rapid, day 18, Lava Falls. Now, every time you go into one of these situations, you think it's like going into chaos, but there is a map. It's kind of a, in kayaking, they call it the line. It's, it's, and, and lava's line is even tougher than upset. And you start in on the right, and you edge against this eddy line, and then these boils hit you. They're like these monster tails that want to whip you into this massive hole. Uh, and you get by that, you hit the V waves, these big giant waves that come together. You hit just to the left of that, you bounce out into the river, you turn right, you go into the great kahuna waves, these giant 20-foot waves that crash over you one after the next. You squeak by cheese grater rock, and uh, that's self-explanatory. And then, <laughs> and then you ride all those boils and whirlpools out of Lava Falls. Uh, this is head and shoulders, the biggest rapid. And I got in my boat. I was, I, I experienced the river. It was now a friendly place. It was now this entity I could trust. 
I, and, and, and I got into my boat, and, and one of those boils hit me. It was bad timing. I was a little slow, and I was upside down going into Lava Falls, not part of the map. I rolled up, I missed the ledge hole, I hit the V-Wave cockeyed, it sent me into a massive cartwheel. I went through that upside down, I rolled up, and I was now going into the Big Kahuna Ways backwards. That's not part of the map. I, roll, I got knocked over, I rolled up, I could barely get a breath under all this weight. Harlan, as it turns out, he had braced his paddle against one of these massive waves. It, bash, it busted his carbon fiber paddle in half, smashed him in the nose. He was upside down and uh, thinking, how do I roll up uh, with two halves of my shattered paddle and um, no blood pouring out his nose? thinking, how do I communicate with Eric? I panicked, I pulled my skirt, and I was swimming blind through lava falls. That is not part of the map. Uh, uh, you know, you have this moment where you feel like you've discovered something, and the next minute, you're crushed. I sat on the side of the river, head in my hands, and, uh, and then uh, later on, camped just below lava. Uh, and, and, and I thought about this journey that we're on, you know, and, and you, you, you want to believe that this journey is a good one, that, you know, if we accept, if we kind of take on this no barriers life, we build this great team around us, we move forward, uh, and, and we have faith uh, that all those barriers, they fall down before us, and we are, we are sort of gifted with the storybook ending, and that hadn't happened. I had swum through this rapid like a drowned rat. And I thought, maybe it's these great forces that tell the story. You know, the catastrophic event that changes the course of history, or the adversity that knocks us down, says never get up again, or maybe um, that diagnosis that we never asked for. Maybe these are the things that tell the story. Maybe humans are just sort of canyon walls being eroded by time and circumstances. And then I thought about these decisions that we make. You know, we make them all the time. They either propel us forward along that map or they stop us in our tracks. And then I thought about those people who I'd met along the way, like Hugh and Mark and Amanda, these people who had illuminated parts of the map that I wanted to navigate. And then I thought about Terry Fox again. And I thought about those moments, those moments where you want to flee, where you want to shrink and protect yourself. You have to do something counterintuitive. You have to tap into something deeper uh, to open your heart and allow that light to shine. And I thought I, I, I had a sleepless night and I woke up and I said, Harlan, I don't think I'm done. Let's try lava again. Um, so we hiked back up and this is my second run through lava. Check this. All right, take a nice deep breath, buddy. We're gonna have a good run. Let's just be here in the moment.
Um, It was after that that I jumped right into a no barriers expedition and I was leading one of our warriors groups, our veterans groups. I met a guy named Paul, Paul Smith. Paul Smith had lived a pretty tough life uh, because uh, when he was a kid, his, his mom was killed and uh, that overwhelmed the family and they sent him off to school, to military school. He graduated and then uh, he was always consumed by feelings of helplessness. Uh, because of that trauma, he joined the military. He wanted to be part of something bigger than himself, and he was proud to serve. And, and then an IED exploded in his armored vehicle, and it burned him over 50% of his body, pits and scars all over his body. And that wasn't the problem. He told me that pain, he could live with that, the burns and the scars. The real problem, the real barrier was the shame. And all those feelings of shame started flooding back into his life. His life spiraled downward. He got into drugs and alcohol, car accidents, uh, suicide attempt. Uh, and he had uh, what they call their alive day, it's the anniversary of their injury. Well, one of those alive days, Paul spent in jail. Um, but a few years ago, he sent it, spent it with us. Um, his alive day with us at No Barriers, high up in the Rocky Mountains. And we sat together on this trail, on this trailhead, ready to head to the summit. And Paul told, turned to me and, and he said, Eric, I feel like I have squandered a lot of time. He said, but recently I feel like I've awakened from a dream. And I know now I need a life of purpose. And we headed up to the summit Along the way, the soldiers passed a crevasse, a big giant crevasse, and one of the soldiers picked up a rock and he threw it in that crevasse. And he said, that rock, it represents my nightmares and I'm putting them behind me. And as the vets turned back around, Paul said, you know, most of the time you spend looking at your feet, right? And the mountains and in life. He said, but he took a moment to look out over to this beautiful, beautiful landscape. And, and he was so high, he could see these ridges, sharp, spiny ridges shooting out in every direction like stars. And then he was so high, he could see over, the, over those ridges to the foothills and all the way over the foothills to the grasslands, to these beautiful prairies that rolled out all the way to the horizon as far as the eye could see. And Paul was also seeing his purpose and his potential unfolding as vast and infinite as the landscape itself. And it was the first time, he said, in a very long time, he could see his future. That's no barriers. Ultimately, that is no barriers. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for celebrating. Yuri. Yuri, Yuri, Yuri. Yuri, Yuri, Yuri. Thank you so much. Thank you.